So anyway, he looked at her and she laughed so much that she jaw locked herself. He had to go and get the doctor to put her jaws together. So anyway, they were taken away and was married. This ran on and run on and the old king, he built them a castle for to stay in and oh, they was having a great time. And he says, you know, he said to his wife one day, you know, my mother is awful poor and we've got to go and tell her where I am and what luck I've struck and everything. So they went home, him and her. They took this big hatchet and they went and they got his mother and brought the mother there. And when I left there, they was having a good time. The old woman was living with the son and they had all kinds of money and having a great time after all. So there you go. That's the last of it. Oh, hello. I didn't see you there. My name is Ian and today we're talking about Wilmot McDonald's The Bull Story. Although we're not really talking that much about Wilmot McDonald's The Bull Story. We're talking far more about, well, what to say. We're talking about what it is that we imagine we are studying when we are studying a folktale. There's, like, what is the, what is the object of our study? Is it, is it the text? And maybe it is the text. Maybe we are trying to create a series of words that are representative of the way that they are spoken. Uh, maybe, maybe we're studying the story, where the texts are, uh, you know, the words are way into that story, but we don't need to hold them precious. We sort of just imagine them as some kind of uh, gateway into some story that's there. And that's particularly the case if we are uh, just assuming that most stories are retellings of something that was somehow better. And we have this, you know, bad photocopy idea of folks, folk storytelling, that what we have are copies of copies of copies, and the resolution is less, and imperfections have come in over time. Uh, game of telephone is another metaphor that's sometimes used, because we imagine that somewhere, somewhere down the line, there was this pure form, and that pure form is somehow gone. But all we have until it enters into some kind of written record, all we have are people's uh, contemporary tellings of them. So, uh, all right, let's hear it, because I w want to be able to reconstruct. Or are we interested in the performance? Are, are we interested in it not simply as a set of words, and uh, not simply, you know, as a set of words that's kind of incidental, but the only way that we can get to the true story behind it, or the real story, I should say, um, or are we interested in it as a, as, a, as a specific dynamic instance where it's not just words and it's not just words telling a story, but, it, but it's a dynamic uh, lived experience that takes place in real time and to people, um, you know, meant for being appreciated by a very real, tangible, specific audience that the storyteller is actually focused on in some way or another. I mean, they're focused on in as much as that is the, 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 the uh, occasion for performance to begin with. The storyteller is there, really only can assume the role of the storyteller uh, when, the, when there's a story listener present. And the story listener completes the task, completes the, the semiotic loop by appreciating, by nodding, by smiling, by leaning in, by judging harshly, leaning back, by, by being bored and by being engaged, following that loop. And depending on your question, whether you think of it as story, whether you think of it as performance, whether you think of it as, as just text, uh, it's going to really affect how you actually represent it in print, because print is still the medium of choice. And even if we're no longer talking paper, we're talking electronic text, it's still rendering speech into letters, um, into some something that has some level of permanence to it. Um, so these are good examples. The reason I chose this uh, particular story 
or, or we focus on this particular story, is because um, it is it's being made present to us in a number of ways. First of all, it's Canadian, and there isn't a huge amount of Canadian uh, tale telling, Mersian telling out there. There's obviously a fair amount, but there's not much in the English language tradition. Um, the, and there are some that are English language, but were sort of like Ukrainian or um, uh, you know, Middle European that have entered into sort of the English language tradition through, through immigration. Um, and of course, there's, there's stuff that happens in Eastern Canada, but, but it's, it's like, like the English themselves. There isn't a huge amount of, like the Eng England itself, there isn't a, uh, it's not a big Mersian telling. Certainly the Mersians of, uh, the Mersian of England uh, tend to fall outside the canon of the Mersian of, of uh, France and Germany and, you know, Mother Goose and, and Grimm and all those people. So it's an interesting collection, but also it was, um, and, it's, and it's, this is from Miramichi, this is from the next province over. So it sort of, you know, has some kind of quasi-local context. Um, and in, uh, but it was published twice. It was published first in um, Northeast Folklore, which was the journal that Sandy Ives, the University of Maine in Orono, started. Uh, and uh, Ives was the, a, if you think of regions and don't necessarily get uh, fetishized by, uh, by national uh, borders, he was based in Maine, but really he was a folklorist of the Northeast woods. So Maine, New Brunswick, parts of Nova Scotia, and he was certainly interested in the community of people who would come from these regions and go into the woods, of, again, of Maine or in New Brunswick, uh, during the log, log, uh, for logging camps, for the lumber camps. He was a, he was the great folklorist of the lumber camps. And um, I could speak about his work um, time and time again. He, he, was, he mainly did song. Helen Creighton, uh, was one of Canada's most famous folklorists. She started uh, she started some of her work in the 1920s, but she'd been going uh, throughout Atlanta, Canada for a number of years. Had introduced such songs. If you know the song uh, "Farewell to Nova Scotia," she it was she at least found it and brought it into the popular context above uh, to the point where then it became part of the folk revival and uh, Irish Rovers and so on. Would would uh, do, uh, do versions of it. Uh, so um, they had both, independently of each other, uh, collected stories from Wilmot McDonald, who was a New Brunswick, uh, you know, he, he worked in the lumber camps as well, but he just had a reputation for storytelling. And they both worked with Louise Manny. Louise Manny was a fascinating character. She was, um, I don't think she was a native New Brunswicker. I think she might have been American, actually like from Massachusetts or Michigan, one of those M places. Um, but she was hired by Lord Beaverbrook to basically kickstart a folk revival and folk song collecting uh, for New Brunswick, as had been happening elsewhere. So Louise Manny sort of became the New Brunswick version of Helen Creighton. She did a bunch of collecting. She published folk songs in New Brunswick, and then she, was, she spearheaded the... Uh, um, New Brunswick Folk Folk Festival, Miramichi, Miramichi Folk Festival, um, uh, which is still going, but she was sort of like the, the overseer of that. So she knew Wilmot. And um, Ives and Crichton separately had both interviewed uh, Wilmot over the years. And uh, then when they were collaborating and recognized that um, they both got these wonderful versions and, and a remarkable overlap, they would publish them as, as this uh, set edition, which was like the second issue of Northeast Folklore in the early 1960s. And it's a great collection, and it was, um, uh, again, one of the few versions of fairy tales of Mersian uh, in Canada, and done, done with an effort at representing voice, because this is 1960. We're just getting to the point, really, uh, where the idea that the folk had their own artistry was finally being embraced. Um, the, that, that, they're, that they were actually creating when they were telling, that they were actually making artistic choices when they were telling. 
So they do a good faith effort at transcribing using the, the, uh, the, the ideas of the day. And Ives, in his introduction, it's the introduction to the entire issue, uh, he talks about uh, he talks about sort of his principles of transcription. Those of us who have heard Wilmot tell his stories can lament that much of their charm is lost in the transfer to print. Folklorists always thus lament uh, at about this point. Uh, it is expected of us, but if the complaint is trite, it is no less true than it ever was. The tape recordings preserve Wilmot's marvelous sense of pace and rhythm, the inflections of his voice, and the obvious zest with which the stories are told, not to mention the grace and lilt of the Miramichi brogue. Uh, but what even the tape recorder cannot give us is Wilmot's presence. When he tells a story, he does not make a big production of it. In fact, he uses gestures very sparingly and makes almost no attempts to act or mimic. But his hold on his audience is as definitive as it, as it is easy, and it must be experienced to be appreciated. And so recognizing that transcription is an indelicate art, and so they're just going to do things like be as... He decided to be as circumspect as he could when he was transcribing. Um, we kept as close, clean, uh, as close to Wilmot's wording as was humanly possible. The only thing I've omitted are false starts, accidental repetitions, and badly confused or incoherent passages, of which there were very few. All such deletions are indicated by ellipsis marks. Um, there are two kinds of omissions I have not marked. In any single line of dialogue, Wilmot often has three or four speech tags. He said, she said, says he, etc. And he makes frequent use of the transitional phrase, so anyway. When Wilmot tells the story, or when one hears it on tape, these things do not get in the way, but in a written transcript, they assume an importance that is out of all proportion. I have, therefore, usually limited the speech tags to one in each speech, and I've cut out about one third of the so anyways. So this has this been published in 62. And a whole generation of folklorists grew up, many of whom had access to this, many of whom read it, many of whom would have, would have read it when they were undergraduates or graduate students. And uh, Pauline Greenhill was one of them, and, and uh, Canadian folklorist. Um, she did her uh, uh, master's degree at Memorial University, she did her PhD at University of Texas at Austin. And um, so, but interested in, in Canadian content specifically, and uh, would have definitely been familiar with this. In fact, she, you know, she, she introduces her introduction by saying, lo and behold, there I was reading this. Um, that's, not how, that's not what she says, but she says the initial impetus for this study came from my reading of Eight Folk Tales from Miramichi as told by Wilmot MacDonald. And um, she had the, she read her, his notes, read what I basically just read to you, that I wonder what those false starts and stops might actually mean. Because in the meantime, the concept of ethnopoetics had basically come up. Uh, and ethnopoetics is looking at the idea that speech is fundamentally a different act than text. We understand it. We understand that to be the case. But we don't necessarily in inhabit that fact uh, easily. And so when we see speech transcribed, on the page, it comes off as bad writing. It's like, ah, this person doesn't know how to write. And because I think we are almost um, stained with the idea that once we see something in print, we're uh, demanding some kind of um, grammatical fluency. That is what text represents. That is what the print typically represents. And uh, but speech doesn't act that way. So ethnic po ethno poetics, sorry, just breaking down the word, ethno having to do with a culture, a group, a place, however one wants to define it, you know, often understood as traditional culture, as in ethnomimesis, in terms of imitating uh, folk cultures, or ethnomusicology, which ethnomusicologists like because they don't like the word traditional music. Um, no, they do like the word traditional music. They don't like the word folk music. But, you know, so, you know, of a, of a place, ethno-methodology, ethno-whatever, ethno-mathematics, which is a really interesting field. And then poetics, which is the study of the aesthetics of language. And that the aesthetics of language is not merely the aesthetics. That aesthetics, therefore, denote some kind of meaning. Um, and, but uh, largely what's meant by aesthetics is the idea that... Um, uh, it is shaped for something, uh, often it's for pleasance, 
Uh, it's for something being pleasant. Sometimes it can be for displeasure. Sometimes it can be for for um, uh, discordance. But really, it's the way that, that language can be shaped in a way that um, denotes something additional to the words and uh, has, has a kind of uh, extra layer of meaning. So ethnopoetics is the aesthetics, aesthetics, say that three more times, aesthetics of language within a particular culture. And, um, and, and, and the idea that you can start to discern the, the aesthetics that are valued by a particular group if you can start to identify the aesthetic patterning. So there are two fairly prominent scholars within, eth within uh, ethnopoetics. One is Del Himes and one is Dennis Tedlock. Del Himes basically um, uh, figured that you could, if you did a close reading of texts that were sort of authentically transcribed or good healthy transcriptions, you could discern the aesthetic patterns that were there. So he would have, pay attention to markers like, like, that's a good example. Yeah, uh, th those very self-same hesitations and utterances and that seem like false starts, and you think of them as, as at the very least, as some kind of like marking system, something that might be introducing some kind of cadence. Uh, Tedlock was a little bit more. Um, I won't, I'm going to say more stringent, but that sounds like Himes wasn't. But basically, he tied it into recordings. Basically, it's like it's fuzzy method whether you can do it um, on, uh, you know, whether you can read it into written texts or not. He, so he went, basically, you know, you can perhaps extrapolate back once you find contemporary cultures, aesthetics, perhaps you can just go back, but for the most part, you, you, you do it in correlation with the tape recorder. And like most of these academic conflicts, they were, um, uh, they actually sort of allowed for a certain kind of creativity. There were, you know, people who weren't invested in being, you know, uh, uh, the king of ethnopoetics were say, they're both good, let's integrate them. And then a lot of good work got done while they were still sort of bickering over, over, um, over uh, not, in, not completely insignificant, but it could have been surmountable differences. Um, so, <coughs> Himes also made the idea, and one of his sort of big, big uh, terms is the idea of breakthrough into performance, and that um, the very self-same aesthetic patterning of language is often something that one um, almost needs to sort of draw. It's not that it's on a unconscious level but it sort of requires one move beyond a sense of self-consciousness. So one of his big insights when he was doing his transcriptions um, is he would notice how initial stories would be halting and they would be, uh, I'm just gonna use the word prosaic as, 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 uh, as verbal art, and then something would happen and then the talk would get better and the talk would get quicker and you would see rhythm and you would see rhyme and you would see pacing that seemed to indicate something and you'd see tone and all of a sudden the ascetic patterning of language is happening and it's not some prosaic uh, flow. It is, uh, it's not some, some prosaic uh, utterances. It's actually flow. It's actually performative. And that idea that you have, that you sort of get into this point, point and you've all probably experienced it. There's, you've all probably experienced someone who does not necessarily tell a good story, all of a sudden telling a good story because fundamentally they are in that moment. They've hit what psychologists call flow, you know, where it's like an unobstructed um, facility with, with the form that is, it's almost a matter of having, um, if you wanted to be, introduce a metaphor, it's almost like the spirit has taken one over, but certainly the, the, you've hit this moment of performance where the self-consciousness is dropped and you have fully accepted this role of tale teller or um, performer. And so you can sort of flow through it that way. Uh, and um, so one of the things 
is how do you represent this text on a page ethnopoetically? How, and if you can do something that approximates it, if you can do something that approximates how the, the words sound, because it isn't so much the matter of the words, that's how the words sound, is that that is how the, the text is shaped. That is how um, it becomes a, um, an artistic creation over and above the mere plucking out of words. And so I've got a clip which I'm inserting here, uh, and I'm very grateful to the Canadian Museum of History and uh, the Folk Studies, uh, Canadian Centre for Folk Studies uh, people who allowed me to use Helen Creighton's tape of the Bull Story, and then uh, we'll see these different transcriptions because on the bottom you will see the transcription that appeared in uh, Ives and Crichton's 1962 Northeast Folklore. And on top you'll see Pauline Greenhills and she's broken it down with broken lines. Uh, and because the, 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 the key idea of ethnopoetics is the notion of, well we already have this thing that is representative of shaped sound. We already have this form on, on, in text that we have and that is poetry. Uh, we, we know the idea of the poem. We know what happens when you have a line break. Uh, even in something like blank verse, the idea of a line, a line break is indicative of something. It's indicative of a second thought or a new pause or, or uh, it introduces at least something in the way of the cadence that it is meant to be spoken in. So even if we're not talking about a rigid poetic form, like uh, dactylic hexameter or iambic pentameter or the villanelle or the limerick or something, at least we know we have the, this format which is about speech being rendered because poetry is like that. Um, it is, um, we understand that poetry is experienceable both as being read, because you can take a book of verses off the shelf and just read through it, and you can also declaim it. You can also say it out loud. Literature isn't quite that. Obviously, we have audio books. That's not the point. But for the most part, literature is a is only really in its primary form uh, read uh, and is not performed. Conversely, you have dr um, uh, drama, and you know drama. You can read a play, but it's meant. It's designed to be done uh, to be performed. So uh, you can read a play to make sense of it. You can read a play to learn the lines in order to perform it. But you know, a play is, lives its primary life on a stage. Um, poetry lives on both and. So this poetic transcription, using line breaks, using this indelicate, still uh, fairly rough idea of print on page and letters and so on, at the very least we can start to introduce some cadence. So this is the bull story, uh, just a little brief excerpt, about so three minutes from the bull story um, with Pauline Greenhill's transcription at the top and Sandy Ives transcription of Helen Creighton's uh, recording of, and both of them are Willard McDonald doing the bull. So anyway, he, he thought pretty hard of this and he went out under an apple tree and he laid down and he fell asleep and he had a dream. So he dreamt that he went to the barn and he screwed off the right horn off of the bull and when he screwed off this horn off of the bull, the bull could talk. And there was everything in the bull's head that you would imagine. There was all kinds of clothes and there was all kinds of anything you wanted to eat in the bull's head and the bull could talk. Well, he woke up laughing to himself, which he, when he laid down, he was crying about the bull being sold. So the bull could talk, so anyway, he went out and he gave her a yank anyway. He said, I'm going to try her a yank. So when he tried her a yank, she started to spin off, and behold you, it was, everything was right. So he told the bull what was going to take place. Well, the bull said, the only thing for you to do, he says, when there come, when the butcher comes for to buy me, he says, you tell your uncle 
that when the last time you're going to lead me out, you want to do the job, lead me out. And he says, whenever my heels is clear of that barn door, you jump onto me back, and that's the last they'll see of us. Well, he did so. The butcher come, and the young fellow said to the old uncle, he said, Beans, you're going to kill the bull. I want to lead him out for the last time. Well, the uncle said, all right. He was going to get this junk of money, and he just blabbered the young lad up that way. So anyway, away he went. So he just got clear of the barn, and when he jumped onto that bull's back, he just roared to the old man. He said, good morning, boss, he said, when we straight hard putting. So they traveled all that day. So that night, they come to a brook, and they get off, and the young fellow screwed the, the horn off of the bull and took this big tablecloth and spread it out on the ground, and he had anything you wanted to eat there, baked beans and everything. So he had a big feed of hot biscuit, and, and the bull, after that, the bull, he fed around and drunk water in the brook, and he fed along the side of the road, and the first thing is, awful howling and roaring struck up in the woods. And anyway, he said, uh, the bull said to him, he says, I got to go to a bullfight tonight. <laughs> and he says, look it, when I'm gone, he said, if that brook runs clear water all night, I'll be back in the morning. But if she runs muddy, he says, you'll know I'm dead. And he says, you take my track the next morning and you follow me. And he said, when you come to me, and if I'm dead, you take a rib out of my right side, take a strip of skin from the butt of my horns to the butt of my tail and wear it as a belt. And no matter what you ask those things to do for you, they'll do it. So what did you think? Which, which does it better? You're probably used to... Uh, you're probably most used to reading folktale uh, in paragraph forms. But even such simple things as where he made paragraph breaks, um, I mean, that, that, those are intentional acts. And no one is faulting Ives. This isn't Greenhill talking about how, what a terrible transcriber Ives is. Ives is an excellent transcriber, but he was making, he was making decisions. He was making decisions about how to represent this thing that doesn't live on a page, on a page. Uh, and as was Pauline, Paul, uh, Pauline Greenhill. Pauline was trying to put better examples, uh, or, or at least, I don't even know if I want to use better. She was using different criteria to try and represent something because for a certain kind of reader, that transcription is more evocative of the kind of performance uh, that the folk tale is. It's a lived experience. So if you've read, if you read Sandy Ives' transcription of the bull story, um, it probably sounds very familiar, or looks, use the word sounds there, it probably looks very familiar because you're now used to reading tales this way. Um, uh, and you've been probably reading tales similar to this most of your life, uh, unless you've only been reading um, very, very polished versions. And in the past 20 or 30 years, even in popular collections, there's at least some kind of effort to, well, maybe it's a, it's a false effort, it's a folkloresque effort of, of doing them in kind of a folksy speech. But um, uh, maybe you've come across or, you know, something closer to uh, Ives' transcriptions. Pauline Greenhill's transcription is probably new to you, but oddly satisfying, I find. I find transcription a, a fascinating thing. And when I teach transcription, this is kind of the technique that I, that I demonstrate because ultimately, uh, and what Ives will go on to do is he, he, uh, he writes the tape-recorded interview, which is one of the most important field manuals for how to do interviews, and it's a very basic stuff like how a microphone works and so on. But he has a wonderful section on transcription, which is still good, even though his second edition was 1995. And I mean, his first edition was still using reel to reel. His second edition, he finally, you know, migrated to cassette tapes. So, but, so some of the issues of storage are, 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 um, 
are old fashioned, but his ideas of transcription. But basically, the, the, the notion is the original exists. This recording still exists. It's hard to come by. It's only available at the library, uh, the, the National, uh, National Museum, and you kind of have to know, know a dude who knows a dude in order to get it, but it still exists. So it is there. Um, the, but the transcriptions are entry points into performance. If you think that they are wholly representative, and if you make the claim that they are wholly representative, then you are sadly mistaken, or if you're making the claim, you are woefully negligent of your responsibilities. But if you are more or less suggesting that um, here, this is at least a, mo a transcription is at least a mode of analysis that will allow for uh, an approximation of this thing, which we can still exist, which we you know, which still exists, which you can always check it against, which uh, subsequent researchers can always check it against. And now it's twenty something or other, and uh, you know we have the possibility of embedding files and things. So. Really, we just need you know, to stop researching boring stuff like how to cure disease and start getting back to the important things like Canadian folktale study so we can republish these where we have embedded the sounds into them in a way that is perhaps glossier than the little clip that I made uh, for your perusal earlier. When I do transcription for my work, I base it on sort of ethnopoetics, but I'm interested in, I mean, my area is stand-up. So one of the most important things for me is also having a system that takes in the audience's reactions. Because in, I'm not going to say in no other art form, but in very few other art forms, uh, verbal art forms, is the audience's reaction as absolutely fundamentally necessary for the understanding of, of the text than in stand-up. So I have a whole system that talks about uh, audience you know, small laughter, large laughter, a single person laughing, the crowd laughing, oohs, ahs, uh, spoken word from the audience, and so on, applause, uh, palpable silences, because those are all the paralinguistic and sometimes linguistic, but typically paralinguistic uh, cues that the audience brings to the performance because the audience completes it. So uh, you don't hear on the tape, I listen to the whole thing, you don't hear Crichton in the background. At least she's very quiet through that. But in other instances, you can. Uh, and uh, that's something that gets incorporated in transcriptions as well. So, tale, folk literature, these are live events. And we know that they are live events. We intuit that they are live events. We have read enough about them that they are live events that we grasp it. But you, it's something that it still takes a very long time to inhabit. So thinking about this issue, which should be boring, but thinking about this issue of transcription and why a text is sometimes unimpressive when you read it. And like, oh, what's going on? Just thinking about it, actually listening to actual context from, this was nine, late 1950s, so uh, 60 years ago, uh, Willard McDonald and Helen Crichton were in Glenwood. Uh, uh, Helen Crichton might have actually interviewed him at Louise Vanny's house in, uh, in, uh, In one of the municipalities, Douglas Town, maybe. Anyway, ah, you got me off on a tangent, you naughty people. Sixty years ago, this very dynamic performer gave this very dynamic performance. He was probably pulling out all the stops because he would have known who Helen Greitens was. He certainly knew who Louise Manny was. He gave it his all and did something quite wonderful with it. And what's on the page in 1962 is, uh, okay, that's nice, that's cool. What's on the page in 1985 is, oh, okay, I see what's going on there. Um, and until now, those are one of the only conduits we have to this ephemeral moment. So as you progress, as you think more and more about folk literature, remind yourself, as painful as it is to remind yourself, because you think I know this already, remind yourself, these are live events, that they're their own aesthetic performances and they're quite wonderful so 
listen at your pleasure to Wilmette McDonald's The Bull Story uh, if you ever have the chance. Other than that, I am done. As ever, my friends, I wish you so well. Goodbye.